welcome to Lifestyle Solopreneur, the community for entrepreneurs who put lifestyle first. Join your host, Flavia Barris, as she interviews successful lifestyle solopreneurs and shares ideas to help you find the perfect balance between lifestyle, business, and self. Flavia is an attorney, marketing expert, and founder of several online academies. She's been featured in major media, including BBC World News, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Post, ESPN Television, and more. Join us for this episode of Lifestyle Solopreneur. Hey, Lifestyle Solopreneurs. Today, we get to speak with Jeremy Schneider. After starting an internet company in college and selling that company at the age of only 34 for over $5 million and retiring at age 36, he has dedicated his life to teaching personal finance. He founded Personal Finance Club, a community of champions of the individual investor who help further financial education for all. Thank you for joining us today, Jeremy. Hi, Fabia. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on here, number one, because I'm a big, big fan of financial literacy. I think it is something that is woefully missing, number one, from even just our public education system. Like I think everyone who gets a high school degree, you know, let's take it a step further. I think you're graduating middle school. You should already have a working understanding of things like credit cards and interest rates and, you know, a few things. I mean, we're already teaching people math, right? So why not take it a step further and teach about finance, which is where you can actually take your math and apply it to something that's useful and will affect you your whole life. It is the biggest part and challenge of adulting that I think people struggle with. So tell us a little bit about how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, I fully agree. It's kind of wild that we have this education system that teaches all these subjects with the one major goal is to make a living. And then we don't teach the metric by which we measure that living, which is money, which is how you make it and how you keep it and how you grow it. And yeah, even though I've been in this personal financial literacy space for the last four and a half years or so, still you can like walk into like any city in the US and ask any person some basic financial knowledge questions like credit scores and like I said, credit cards and index funds and Roth IRAs and people generally have no idea. And so it's kind of scary that We've like armed people or tasked people with making a living, but don't arm them with the, you know, the skill set to like basically manage that well. And yeah, and I think just what you described is why I'm doing what I'm doing. So I retired when I was 36. I did nothing for a year or so after that. And then I decided to follow my passion, which is helping people with personal finance literacy. And there's still a lot of work to do. Retiring early at 36, I could see that as a challenge. I don't know if you've ever seen a movie. It's an older movie now. It's got Hugh Grant in it. It's called About a Boy. And in the movie, Hugh Grant, and this is not a spoiler at all, you know, it's early on in the movie that you learn this fact. He's sort of a, think of him as a trust fund baby. He's a guy who's pretty young. He's in his 30s, I think, in the movie. And he doesn't need to work and never has. I won't go into why he has this sort of fixed income that comes in every month. So he's a guy that doesn't work. But to be so young and not work, he, he described it as I had to be my own activities director, like on a cruise ship or something. Like every Monday I watch this TV show and then I go get my hair done. And then I do this because he had to fill his time. And ultimately in the movie, he finds greater meaning in life. He's not just trying to fill the hours. He, um, I won't spoil that part, but it just kind of reminds me when I hear someone that retires really young, I'm like, well, they're going to need to do something because like at that age, you still have so much energy and the goals will come to you even if you didn't have them at that moment. So for you, what did that look like? You were 36, you did nothing for a year, but what sparked it for you so that you got back into doing something, a big project? Yeah, they say that the, the reward for financial independence is an existential crisis because I think many of us, are just chasing money most of our lives. Not like that that's like what we, the only thing we value or whatever, but the primary tension in your work life is like, okay, I need to go to work to make money. And I have financial goals, like buying a car, buying a house, saving, investing. And then for me, I had a very weird experience where I was living very frugally on $36,000 a year. That was my max take-home salary for the, all the years I was growing my business. And then I uh, like with the click of a button, I basically became a multimillionaire overnight. And I was like, wow, you know, I did the, I worked at the company that acquired my company for two years and did the math. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I ever need to work again. 
But then you have the existential crisis, which is, okay, now what? And so for the first, you know, I always saw that as like a finish line where I was like, all right, I'm going to sell my company and put my arms in the air and I did it. And then I would like travel and do the things that you, you know, think you want to do, which is what I did. I like went to Italy for two months and like coached beach volleyball and I went to Australia for five weeks and I was like playing video games and just having fun. But after a year or so of that, it just kind of felt pretty empty. Like I didn't have any purpose. I wasn't making any progress. I wasn't building anything. I wasn't working towards anything. And I didn't really want my life story to be, you know, I sold a company when I was 34 and then was a piece of shit for 30 years or 40 or whatever, however long, hopefully, hopefully more than that, that I live. And so, yeah, I, I, I wanted more. And, and that, that's kind of how Personal Finance Club came about, which is I wanted to build something. And one winter break, I was over Christmas break, I was on vacation and I uninstalled this video game. I was playing and kind of got addicted to cold turkey and set a goal. I was gonna, I was like, oh, I'm gonna start an Instagram account teaching people about personal finance, and I'm gonna set a goal of getting fifty thousand followers in one year. And it wasn't even a financial goal. I wasn't trying to sell anything. I wasn't trying to make any money. I was just like, it's just a progress goal. So I felt like I was building something, and maybe that would like lead to other fun stuff, which is what I did. So let's deconstruct personal finance for a second, because I think financial education is so bad in this country, probably in maybe even the world, but it is. To the level where if someone hears the abstract term personal finance, they may not know exactly what that means. So break it down for us. What things do you consider personal finance knowledge? Like what are the topics that people learn about when they undertake a study of personal finance? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I think the word finance in general is this intimidating word. You know, you think about finance, you think about these like bankers on Wall Street doing really complex, (laughs) right? People in suits, like trading derivatives or, you know, this really like abstract complex stuff that just does not mean anything to your average person. But, you know, personal finance, I'd say is, is like just how a person handles their money, how they spend it, what they spend it on. So things like budgeting, you know, are you spending all your money? Things like saving, things like checking versus savings accounts, things like interest rates, interest, whether you're paying it with a credit card or with a car loan or with a home loan, or interest, whether you're earning it with like a high yield savings account or with investments, things like investing, the different types of accounts, like your brokerage account and 401k or IRA, even things like insurance, like which types you should have, things like even estate planning, how to, how to manage. And so this whole world, you know, it, it's even when I'm saying those things, it's kind of a lot and everyone since it's not part of our education, I feel like there's this pop culture sense that everyone should just automatically know all this stuff. And they think everybody else knows this stuff. Like I once, I got a DM from someone on Instagram and they said, you know, Jeremy, I'm so far behind. I, I haven't even started investing yet. Is it, is it too late for me? Can I even start? And I said, how old are you? And they said, 23. And I wanted to like reach through my phone and grab them by the shirt collar and shake them back and forth. And tell them that they're still like an actual infant baby. But you know, it just goes, goes to show that like there's a sense like, oh, everyone else understands the stuff and I'm behind. But it's not true. And it's a lot to learn. And so I think it it like deserves some focus and energy on your own because you work 40 hours a week to try to make this money. But then if you just don't know how to manage it and it just goes away, which is what happens to a lot of us, then you know, it's, you're kind of just on the the rat race. You're in, you're on the mouse wheel without making progress. There's people who think learning about the financial world and and finances in general is something that you do once you're wealthy. And then I don't know, for me, I'm like, no, no, no. (laughs) These are fundamentals. Like this stuff is, it's so important to do it. And maybe because, well, I work in estate planning, right? I'm an attorney, listeners of the show know this. So I'm an attorney that works in primarily real estate law, like commercial leasing and purchase and sale. And I do some estate planning, business formation. So I have that insight as to the clients that come to me, but I also have a real estate brokerage. We help people buy and sell homes. And then we also do property management, mostly furnished rentals, some unfurnished. So I'm someone that actually reviews tenant applications for housing, right? Housing is this basic need. It's so important. And when we see a credit report or an application that's got just a lot of kind of landmines in it, like, ooh, like collections. It's a collections item, but it was over $300. Like, how did a $300 bill get to collections? And then having these conversations with people, you realize that they just didn't really know sort of the consequences of some of the actions. Like, they didn't realize that if they just ignored the utility company who kept sending them bills for $300 because they didn't agree with maybe 
well, no, I was supposed to have turned it off when I moved out. Some of that is for actually the people who moved in after me. I just forgot to turn off my... So I don't want to pay it and I never did. And it's like, well, but now it's a collections item on your credit and your credit score went down like 200 points. And so I think it doesn't matter. if Even if you're scraping by paycheck to paycheck, Jeremy, what would you say to someone like that who's like, I will wait until I have more money and higher income before I worry about any of this stuff you teach? Yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I hear that too. And it's just, it's just not true. Wealthy people got there by learning when they weren't wealthy and by doing the simple things. It's kind of like, I'm going to wait to work out until I'm an Olympic athlete. And it's like, nope, you got you to gotta work out first and then you become the Olympic athlete. And it can be, it can seem frustrating because you're like, I have no money to know what to do. It's like, but these little decisions you make along the way, I mean, just the things I always say are, there's two basic rules to building wealth, which is one, live below your means and two, invest early and often. And living below your means is just a skill that you need to learn at lower incomes. And so some people who make $50,000 a year think, okay, there's no way I could live below my means. But some people make $40,000 a year. And if you can, you can make $50,000 a year and live like you're making $40,000 a year, that $10,000 delta per year can easily make you a multimillionaire over the course of your career. And so you shouldn't be making $50,000 thinking, I, this isn't for me. I've got no chance. I'm just going to spend every dollar I get and kick the can down the road and hope something happens. You, you need to take, the, you know, take those steps now. And then you do build wealth, increase your income, your money starts working for you. That's when things start to go better and faster down the road. But you know, like anything, you have to start small at the beginning. That's so funny because I, so I teach at the local law school. So all these bright eyed, bushy tail lawyer, well, they're not really bright eyed, bushy tail. They're actually look exhausted because they're about to take the bar. And, and I just teach one trimester a year. I'm an adjunct professor. So I just go in two hours at a time for a few weeks to teach them. But at the very end of the class, because I know a lot of them are about to graduate, I tell them the best advice I can give you that's not advice about the law or being a lawyer, but just life advice is you have a lifestyle right now because you don't really have a job. Maybe you're just interning. So you've been living really frugally for the last two and a half years, you know, almost three years of law school. If you can just live that frugally for the first few years when you are out there as an attorney, you will do so well if you can just utilize that bonus income. Like, you know, there's going to be this new income that you didn't have before. But if you can live super frugal and invest the rest, and, you know, because I do real estate, I'm, you see things from your own lens. I'm more of a real estate person. I'm not really into the stocks and all that. But, you know, you do what you know. You might be able to retire and not be a lawyer uh, because if you're a lawyer long enough, you get to either the point of burnout. Or, you know, you either just burn out because the lifestyle's hard or you just lose interest. You know, your passion for it is gone or you just have other priorities. And the best thing you can do is to have that ability to step away and sort of downsize your business or start something new. And the best way to do that when you're any kind of a professional, whatever you are, if you're making a good income is to live as frugal as possible. So Jeremy, I love that. Do you have tips for people? Because I think living below your means is much more of a challenge. It's so easier... It's easy to say live below your means, but really hard to put that into practice. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things that's simple, but not easy. Like much of life, there's nothing magical that there. spend less than you make, but there's lots of habits and behaviors and emotions and pop culture and marketing and keeping up with the Joneses, all this stuff that kind of plays into our behavior with money every day that is layered on top of that simple idea of spend less than you make. I'd say like one one thing to do is the concept of paying yourself first. And I think a lot of people kind of just naturally, a lot of people aren't going to budget. You know, there's like some people in the finance world, like wave their finger or wag their finger at at young people and say, oh, you should be budgeting. But the reality is, is like most people aren't going to actually like have a detailed spreadsheet budgeting. But, and so what happens then is you're just looking at your checking account every once in a while and seeing if you have money or not. And if you do, then you just end up spending it on the things that you want. And so one tip is to basically do kind of a DIY budget or an auto budget where you have transfers coming out of your paycheck, out of your checking account automatically going into separate high yield savings accounts that are out of sight, out of mind into investing into maxing out your Roth IRA, maxing out your 401k, maybe going to a brokerage account. And so figuring out, okay, if I can, based on whatever your income is, take $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 a month, wherever you're at, and automatically shuffled off to all those places, then you know you're setting yourself up 
for building wealth over time. And then whatever is left in your checking account, you can just spend. Whereas if, if it's all just in your checking account and you're spending first and then trying to save some for investing later, you'll end up never getting there and just spending it all. Like the, <laughs> we have a, we love to go up to the mountains and there's these huge squirrels. Like I'm not sure what's going on with the air up there, but these squirrels are humongous and they come in, they're collecting all their stuff, but you know, they eat some, but then they have to put some away. Otherwise you're going to starve later. But it's instinctive for them. You know, they're just an animal. But for humans, we just don't have that instinct. I feel like people don't save for a rainy day. So I like that you're saying, make it as kind of automatic as possible. So it just happens on its own without you having to put too much thought into it. What are some other things? So other than living below your means, what are some of the other really challenging things that you have to coach people through or teach them? I think there's just this misperception of wealth in general. And I think that we often, Again, since we don't teach money, we just kind of get these impressions as children and then never question them throughout life. And I've noticed that myself. Like when I'm, I remember being in my early 20s and seeing like a Lamborghini drive by or something like that and thinking like, wow, like that person must be so rich. What a car, you know? And then now that I'm a multimillionaire, I was on the freeway the other day and a Lamborghini drove by me and I thought, that's ridiculous. What a, what a clown. I bet that person's like borrowed money to buy that car and spent all their money on that car. And, and so there's this like, I have this different view of wealth where, you know, if, and I'm painting with a broad brush, of course, some very, you know, wealthy people drive very fancy cars, but most wealthy people don't flash their wealth. They don't want to be, you know, drawing attention to themselves. They don't want to be revving their engine on the freeway or whatever. And we grow up with this misimpression that spending is well, like the bigger house you get, the more drinks you're buying at the bar, the fancier clothes you're wearing, the fancier car you're driving as well. But wealth isn't spending. Wealth is what you have left over after spending. And so most wealthy people are living more modestly and don't want to draw attention to themselves and are driving used cars and building real wealth, which buys them a few things. It buys them peace of mind during the day, just today, right? If, you, if you're making huge car payments and if you lose your job, your life falls apart because you're living paycheck to paycheck and just can barely make keep up with all your payments. That's like a stressful way of living and not very happy and doesn't lead to like successful, healthy relationships and an internal sense of happiness. And also you're setting yourself up for even worse things down the road when you still have all these payments coming after you and you don't have any savings or retirement. On the flip side, if you are living more modestly and investing along the way, you feel happier today because you feel more optimistic about the future, less risk of your life blowing up if you have some sort of job or life event happen. And of course, you're, putting, you're selling yourself up for a much better situation on the road where you've got that financial freedom and choices and, and things that you always talk about. And so you brought up the house question, right? People buy a nice house or housing is such a critical discussion point right now, especially in high priced cities where housing is very expensive and some people just say unaffordable. Any of the coastal cities or you know the bigger cities, it's, it's a real issue what is your personal take on should people buy or rent? There's no blanket thing that everyone should do. I mean, you don't have blanket advice that would apply to everybody. But I hear so much sort of controversy around the unaffordability of housing and then also the strategies. And I work in real estate. So I hear a lot, maybe it seems like a bigger issue in my world because I'm so close to it. But I'm curious when you know, you're know you helping people with their financial literacy and their financial outlook and, and how they view the world, What's your take on housing and housing costs and the things people should consider before going one way or the other on the buy versus rent decision path? I love this question. And it's always, you're in this world, but even in, even in my world or any world, it's always like super controversial. When you like offer an opinion, people like oh, take offense for whatever reason. I think it's some realtors whose livelihood depends on selling homes or some homeowners who got made a bad decision or whatever. But there's this myth that rent is throwing money away. I don't even know where that phrase came from. It's so ridiculous. We don't use that term about, about any other money that we spend on goods or services. It's like groceries is spending money away. You should have your, you should be growing your own farm or driving a car is throwing a money away. You should be building your own car. It's crazy because we pay for goods and services to run our lives. And on the flip side, buying a home is very expensive. There's a mortgage you're paying down, but there's mortgage interest. There's realtors fees. There's homeowners insurance. There's property tax. There's maintenance. There's all these expenses that are 100% sunk costs, losing the money, 100% throwing money away in the exact same way that rent is. And so people fall into this trap of thinking rent is throwing money away, or renting is throwing money away, but buying is always a great deal. 
therefore I should buy indiscriminately. And a typical trap people fall into is like they're renting pretty modestly, like a one or two bedroom apartment, and they maybe have roommates, or maybe it's like a building with many units. So there's some economies of scale where the rent is actually cheaper than if you were buying your own house. But then they decide to buy, and instead of buying a similar unit, they go buy a man. They go buy a mansion. They're like, well, I'm, I'm buying. I might as well do it right. And so they they go from paying like twelve or fifteen hundred dollars of rent to like a two or three thousand dollar mortgage payment plus two or three thousand dollars more per month and all those other expenses that accumulate. You know, not every single month is going to have a huge maintenance expense, but one year you get a roof that goes out. You have to spend fifteen thousand dollars on a roof, and you're neighbor wants to replace the fence, you have to pay half of that. And there's all these expenses that come with home ownership. And so by the math, renting or buying is kind of a nuanced issue. It depends on your area, it depends on interest rates, it depends on future appreciation of the homes, it depends on like 50 different factors that we can't all know, and, and largely depending on your, your area, right? So in Southern California, where we both live, if I talk to someone who is renting a modestly priced place, I tell them every month you rent, you're going to become more wealthy because home prices are just so out of whack compared to rent prices. Even though rent's high, home prices are even more. And so the by the math, it depends on your area. But what really matters is just the behavior of people overspending when they buy a home. And so for sure, renting a modest place will leave you much more wealthy than buying an expensive home. But the flip is, is true too. If you're paying five or 6,000 bucks a month renting a, a mansion and you could buy a modest starter home cheaper, then that would be better off. And so I think people need to like unplug this weird misperception that any type of rent is throwing the money away because there's huge advantages to renting. Like for example, you don't have to put down a massive down payment when you're renting. You can invest that down payment. You can also, you know, you're not on the hook for maintenance expenses. Like they say, rent is the most you'll ever pay, whereas a mortgage is the least you'll ever pay. All the other expenses are on you with mortgage. And of course, renting is more flexible and there's lifestyle things. And so at the end of the day, minimize your housing expenses, whether it's renting or buying. And then maybe you can do some math on your area decide decide if there's one better option over the other based on how long you're going to stay there and all those things. Yeah. And one thing you said kind of applies here too. You were saying that when you want a frugal lifestyle, it's really hard to not choose to live paycheck to paycheck. I think it's also really hard for people to not live in the nicest house or the nicest neighborhood that they can possibly afford or be in. And you were saying someone who makes 50,000 a year thinks like, I can't cut expenses anymore. Like this is what like every dollar I make, I need for my lifestyle. But then you pointed out, hey, that guy down the street only makes 40,000 and still makes it work. So there should be a delta there of $10,000 that can definitely be repurposed because if he has a decent life at 40,000, you should be able to cut back your expenses to 40,000 and and also then have extra money. You actually have a bonus of an extra 10,000. He doesn't. But I think the same thing applies to homes too, where some people are like, no, I I need this number of bedrooms or I need this yard or I have to live in this neighborhood. But there are plenty of happy people who don't have the yard or might not be in that neighborhood or and and you can still do it. I'll give you one story. I was around during the last recession. So I remember there were not just layoffs, but also a lot of companies were just cutting people's salaries. So like the opposite of a raise. A raise is when they're like, hey, you're going to make this percent more. The cuts in compensation or in income was when they said, we're cutting everyone's salary by 10% or whatever it was. Here's your new salary, but at least we're not firing you. So you should be thanking us, right? And that was in like circa 2008, 2009, at least in my industry, a lot of that was happening. And when people had their salaries cut, there was a lot of grumbling. There was a lot of bellyache, but most people just still survived and just cut back on certain things or they moved or did what they had to do to still live a good life, you know, and they were all professionals. So they were making decent money before the cut. And they were still making what many people would consider very decent money after the cut. And so that, I think that that's the mentality you should have is, if I was to get a pay cut of 10%, because we dip into another recession, it would make sense to have a lifestyle where your life would go on in, uninterrupted, you didn't have to make any changes, maybe you were saving a little bit less or investing less, but it wouldn't be this dire, crazy life-changing event where you got a, a salary cut because maybe someday you just want to take a different job and it might pay less. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that lifestyle creep is so tempting to all of us. I think everyone thinks happiness is right over the next thing you buy or like the next bedroom. And 
And it's all a matter of perspective. Like in my own personal life, when I think about my happiest moments in life, I don't, they just don't correlate with me spending the most money. It's not like, I'm like, oh man, in college, it was so great because I lived in a mansion. You know, it's like college was fun because you had, you know, you were living in a six with six roommates or whatever, you know, or think about it from another perspective. Like what if you were homeless and you were really down on your luck and you somehow got like the cheapest one bedroom apartment in town and you finally could lock the door and have a couch and have a TV. Like what a dream that would be, right? Meanwhile, other people are like, if I don't have a walk in humidor in my next house, like how could I even be happy, right? And so I think that these next spending bumps give like a little tiny short term duration endorphin boost. Like when you buy a new car, or you take a first class flight or something like that, like it's this little endorphin boost. But it, as soon as it's over, your long term happiness trends back to exactly where it was. And so I think people keep chasing those little endorphin boosts thinking, that's going to eventually step up to happiness, but it doesn't. And they're no more happy. And so, but I think things that do lead to happiness are things like freedom with your time, strong relationships, and relationships, <laughs> probably beyond my scope of expertise, but certainly money doesn't buy them. And, and freedom with your time, money can buy if you don't spend it. I mean, so I, I think like kind of separating this short term endorphin boost you get from spending with replace that with thinking more long term about what actually brings happiness and perspective about how that next humidor is not going to actually lead you to happiness and be thankful for what you have. I think that's a better way to view spending. So my number one thing is I like to respect people's time. And Jeremy, I could talk to you for hours about we could wax poetic philosophically about finance, ways that people can live their life better and in a way that is going to leave a legacy, right? For their families, for who comes next. And I, I could do that, but we can't because your time is valuable and I want to respect it. And I know our listeners probably want to actually head over to figure out where to find more of you. You have, you're out there quite a bit. I know you're not just on this podcast. You've been on many podcasts. Your advice, uh, which is very motivating and inspiring is out there for the world to find. So where would someone go to learn more about you? Thanks, Flavia. Yeah. Personal Finance Club is the name of my brand where we teach personal finance and uh, investing. And most of the magic is on Instagram. If you're on Instagram, we have almost half a million followers on Instagram where we give kind of daily little fun fact infographics to help all these little things. And we've got a website, YouTube, TikTok. Yeah, just Google personal finance club. And if you, you know, our kind of specialty is getting started investing. So if the concept of like index funds and Roth IRAs and which stocks to buy and stocks versus bonds in this whole world is not super clear to you. We do have like a free start here video series. It's 10 five minute videos. You don't need to put your email address in. It's just totally free. That kind of walks you through that stuff. And I think it takes away some of the scary words around the finance world that a lot of us are intimidated by and walks you through kind of the basics of like how to do it right. I know the word finance, right? It's like, I wish they would change it. Maybe we should call it adulting. And then people be like, yeah. oh, that's something I want. I want to learn adulting. I don't want to learn finance, but I'd love to learn adulting. So I, but I love it. So personalfinanceclub.com yes. is where listeners can go to learn more about you, Jeremy. Thank you for being on the show today. It's been very enlightening, motivating, and uh, I just am very grateful to you for your time. Thank you for having me, Flavia. It's been a blast. Guess what, lifestyle solopreneurs? If you don't yet have an online business earning you enough passive income to live the life of your dreams, I'd like to suggest you consider trying out Kajabi. Kajabi is an all-in-one solution where you can create and teach online courses, publish a paid newsletter, launch a free or paid podcast, process payments, build one-on-one -on -one coaching portals for your clients, and much, much more. I personally use Kajabi to power numerous successful and profitable online businesses. Lifestyle solopreneurs, there's a free trial of Kajabi waiting for you at this link, www.kfreetrial.com. You can try Kajabi for free, no obligation, by going to www.kajabi.com kfreetrial.com. Again, kfreetrial.com. And that K stands for Kajabi. Starting an online business helped me break free from that corporate grind. And I hope it does the same for you. You have nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Thanks so much for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and see you next time.